फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ ओके गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू दिस इवनिंग्स वेबिनार ब्रॉट यू वीकली बाय ऑर्थोपीडिक रिसर्च एंड एजुकेशन फाउंडेशन थ्रू ऑर्थोपीडी एंड टुडे वी हैव नन अदर देन डॉक्टर अशोक श्याम हु इज सिनोनिमस विद ऑर्थो टीवी एंड हु इज going to teach us about uh, the art of manuscript writing i think this is becoming an increasingly important part of anyone's uh, cv today uh, i think writing papers is essential but to be able to write you have to be able to get them published and that needs a certain sort of uh, way and method of doing it and i think Uh, there's probably no one better than Dr. Fox um, to tell us about it. So over to you, Ashok. Thank you very much, sir. And start my screen share. So first of all, I like to thank Dr. John Lukapathe and ORF Foundation and Janki for giving me this opportunity for presenting this. So I've been uh, writing and publishing since two thousand seven. and uh, it's and i've been editing few journals since a decade more than a decade now so i think i have some grasp of uh, how to write an article and how to go about uh with journal writing and research part so i'm going to share my experience not not just the format of the standard format of manuscript writing so like i always say research is pursuit of knowledge which i think we all do whenever we are seeing our patients and reading our books and attending our conferences writing an article is just a process where we formalize it and organize it so we all do kind of research at our own level just to formalize and publish it requires certain skill set which we'll talk about in uh, some time so writing a scientific paper at times can feel frustrating and a lot of people find it difficult feel that the acumen is not there or they feel that it is not their cup of tea and things like that i think it is like any other thing it it requires a follow a road map which is laid down for this kind of uh, publishing and writing so we'll just follow the road map and see how it goes around so before you begin to write a paper you need to ask yourself what do you have to say is it worth saying how will it appeal to the reader so in all this scenario reader is one of your main uh, person who is going to for which this is this whole activity is you are doing and how will it appeal to the reader editors and most importantly how will it affect the outcome of patients so the reader and the editor will help you publish this paper but ultimately this research will be utilized for uh treating patients so you have to keep in mind how the reader will apply this knowledge in treating their patients so that's another important part the basic structure of a scientific paper is a imrad format so introduction covers why i did it methods on how i did it results what did i find and discussion what might it mean so this is how the basic structure of a scientific paper is abstract is a stand alone independent part of the paper the whole idea of abstract it is is that it attracts a lot of attention it has to be complete but concise description of a paper it is where you try to sell your paper so most of the time when we are when i am also doing a literature review i read the title of the article then i go and ahead and read the abstract only when these two appeal to me i go ahead and read the full article so that's where the crux of your article lies these are the formats of a form these are the subsections of a formatted or a structured abstract as we call it no unstructured abstract is just a paragraph but even in unstructured you can find follow a similar guideline where you can put up the background it's just one or two sentences about the rationale behind the study that you are going to do questions and purposes is the aims 
or the hypothesis that you are raising in that particular study, a material methods or patients and methods. So different journals will have different heads of headings. Just need to follow them. But it talks about the major uh, methods and techniques that you have used, what outcome measures have you used, how you have measured various things. And results is major and most significant, especially at the complication even in abstracts. Conclusion has to be focused around the clinical relevance of the article. So based your conclusion in your abstract. So here we are just talking about the abstract. You need to avoid making it too long or too short or too detailed. Sometimes people use unexplained short forms, sometimes even references in abstract. So avoid doing all those things. Keep it standard as per the journal guidelines. It should make sense in itself and it should conform to the journal guideline as per the word count. So these are the two basic uh, types of abstracts. It is structured and non-structured. So structures are headings, but follow the MRAD format. Unstructured also is follows the MRAD format, but it's typical of European journals. So depending on the journal guidelines, you can add it. Let's come down to introduction. This is the first part of your uh, article. And it is one of the most misunderstood part of the manuscript. So whenever I, I ask my PG students, what's an introduction mean? They give a standard answer that it is introducing the subject, talk about the subject that they are researching. So if it is Perthes disease, they will talk about history of Perthes and who described it and what is the classification, all that stuff. For a scientific article, introduction is one of the most misunderstood because it is a misnomer. It's not introduction of the subject, it's actually background rationale of the research project. That's what it means. So better to use word background rather than use it as an introduction. The main aim of introduction is to provide to the reader and the editor and the reviewer why you are doing this research project? What is the relevance of this research project? Okay. Here to begin to tell a story, it begins in three parts. So part one begins with what is known, state of what is unknown, and three ends with what your study will try to answer. So in short, you try to find the gap, the knowledge gap that is defined. Now, how do you define a gap? You define a gap by delineating its boundaries. So that is what introduction is about. And how do you delineate the boundary of, of a knowledge gap by doing a literature review? Literature review is the most important part of manuscript writing. So this is how I my take is, if you start reading textbooks and journals, you find that most of the answers, especially in textbooks, you find most of the answers are already there. It will look like a seamless thing. But once you start looking closely, you'll find that there are a lot of gaps in knowledge. And this you can delineate only by doing a thorough literature review on what you are researching. It will not only help you define the knowledge gap, but it will help you format the introduction as well as discussion and the entire layout of the article you can define with the help of literature review. So introduction part one, what is known? Begin with background statement one or two, describe the scope of the study. A lot of people try and describe who the historical aspect of the disease they are studying. Don't do that. Introduction is very focused. Okay. You have to define the knowledge gap that you are trying to address. That's what you. This is one or two sentences you can talk about and move your story forward. What is unknown is the major part of the introduction. The mention other abstracts, preliminary reports. But don't use uh, names of the other investigators. I mean, some of the journals allow that, but mostly just, unless it is a very, very relevant article, mostly use the conclusion from multiple articles and give references. Keep your references to minimum, maybe 12 to 15 references are enough for introduction and literature. If you take the latest one, maybe last two years, last five years. So keep the references to minimum as well as essential. Okay. And part three of the introduction is uh, 
say three, four lines at the end of the introduction, what will your study answer? So you have to state your research question or the hypothesis at this point. You should proceed in this study, we are going to do this particular research or this particular question we are going to uh, address. And that is where the uh, research interest of reader awakens. I mean, this is what you're going to do in, in clarity. Material methods is one of the most theoretical and methodological part of, of uh, article. Here you basically say what you're going to do. So study design based on the aim of your study, you select from the various study design that you're using. I mean, from the hierarchy of evidence, you can select whatever is depending on the aim of the study. Inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria are very, very important. And again, a lot of mistake has been done by selecting this. So this is how I look at it. Inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. So inclusion is the broad term of broad population that you're going to include in your study. And then from that, you have to exclude. So a lot of uh, students do this mistake in terms of, okay, we are going to include more than 60 years old male. So exclusion is less than 60. No, that's not how it is. If you are included more than 60 year old in your inclusion, so from that population of more than 60, what are the people you are going to exclude? Say maybe you want to exclude people with uncontrolled diabetes. So that becomes your exclusion criteria. Okay. It is not that if your inclusion is 60, more than 60 years of age, your exclusion is less than 60. That's a common mistake that a lot of students do. Inclusion and exclusion criteria are very important because they establish external validity and generalizability of the study. It means that how applicable this study or the conclusion of this research will be to a general population. So this is what is defined by inclusion and exclusion criteria. Of course, it is defined by other things, but this is the major thing about inclusion and exclusion. Of course, validated outcome measures have to be utilized. You need to find references for these two. You have to mention what tools you're using for data collection and how the data was collected, who collected the data, until what endpoints. Okay. So in material method, you have to be systematic and clear in giving a method to the researcher that is reading so that he can replicate your research in his own laboratory or in his own setting. So that is what the uh, point of material method is. It should be clear enough for others to uh, replicate your study. Statistics have to be mentioned in your material methods. A small description, not, not a detailed description is essential. You can take help of a statistician to write these uh, write this paragraph. Results are the most accurate part of your manuscript. It needs to be most accurate. Okay. Results are presented only as actual risk study findings. Clear, concise. You convey the important points that, are, that you have found in your result. And you don't go ahead and interpret your results in the in result section. You just mention your results. Okay. It has to be unbiased. You cannot start interpreting your research, uh, results in the results section. Use tables and figures, highlight. So whatever numbers and figures you're using in tables, you don't have to write them again in the text. You need to highlight important points, describe the results that cannot be shown in table and graph in the text. So begin with demography, follow up, any protocol violations and deviations. And and then go ahead with primary outcome, secondary outcome, and subgroup analysis. Preparing. So, again, these terms might look difficult to comprehend, but these are very easy. Primary outcome, secondary outcome is what you have set for your own study. Every study will not have all of these. Some of them will have just a primary outcome or just a second, primary and secondary, no subgroup analysis. <laughs> Certain things that you need to write in your results, which are essential. Okay. So mean has all is always to be written with standard deviation and range in bracket. So whatever number you are writing, give the mean plus or minus standard deviation and the range. 
percentage also have to be written in terms of numerical value 60 percent that means six out of ten or whatever the number is there So don't describe methods. A lot of people start describing again data collection methods in your results section. You don't have to describe. Award statements like patients are randomized and things like that. Those are part of material methods and your study design, not part of your results. Your results is only focused on your results. A lot of many a times when you have large data sets, it is tempting to put only partial or selective results that are uh relevant to you i think it is very misleading and unethical you should put your entire results as they are in your results section improper presentation of p value is again an issue which is common the it is it has a very simple solution just put p value to exact value still three decimal ask your statistician and they will give you those exact p value okay it need not has to be less than 0 0.001 Give them the exact value that is that you have found in your analysis. Duplicating results from table and figures, it will just increase your text. Discussion is one of the major and most relevant section of uh, your manuscript. The purpose is to answer the question that were raised in the introduction. Explain the result of the study. So here you explain it. Discuss your result in context with the related literature. Putting your study in perspective with current scenario and strength and limitation of the study. So I put a uh, um, discussion in four parts, introduction, body, strength and limitation and conclusion. So introductory paragraph is short and concise. It actually summarizes your main results and it answers the question that you raised in the last paragraph of your introduction. So you, sometimes when I'm in a hurry, so after the abstract i'll read the last paragraph of introduction and the first paragraph of discussion and i'll see how correlating they are okay so it will answer the question that the question that i raised and the answer that you have found the so what is the main part of uh, uh, discussion which establishes the relevance of your article okay it has to be elaborate support your answers and your uh, support your results with help of literature compare your result with the literature explain how it will add value to the current clinical scenario and discuss the reason for difference suppose you find something different than the existing literature maybe it is because of your patient population because of your uh different you of your different surgical technique or something else so you need to discuss those points in your discussion strength and limitation has to be always mentioned in your discussion what are the weaknesses of your study what are the biases that are there this is important so that the reader who is reading will have a perspective of how much value he should put on the results of this study and how useful it can be with his own patient treatment okay in conclusion we should mention what was proved and how it was proved whether the date, whatever your data supports has to be put up. Nothing that is supported. I mean, many a times people stretch their data and try to put in uh, conclusions that are like extension of their uh, results. Don't do that. Put your conclusion, which are heavily supported by your data and your results. Other sentences can lie within the scope of your study and uh, something like a future scope or things like that but your conclusion is strictly supported by your data and finally this is what you should not do when you're writing uh, a manuscript data manipulation of course falsification duplication of manuscript redundant publications plagiarism conflict of interest and human use concern that is ethical approval so i've seen all of these over my last 15 years career in, in research and as an editor, all this being done and a lot of retractions have happened and it be, brings a bad name to the entire scene of research. So ethics is very, very important whenever you're publishing. I have some small tips for better writing. So I'll just enumerate them, not go into detail. So first tip is 
read more. So this is very, very important. You need to read more articles of that particular research that you're doing. Of course, it's part of literature review, but in general, read more. It will help you in formatting the article, in laying down your thoughts. As you read more, you can understand what is the thought process of those authors that you're reading. You can understand how they are laying down their thoughts one after the other, so as to reach a logical and rational conclusion. And same thing you can replicate when you are writing. Okay, You have to be clear whatever you are saying so that people who are reading will understand. See, you have spent a lot of time in your study, but the reader is, has just got your study and he is going to finish it in, say, 10 minutes or 12 minutes. So your clarity of thoughts that you have written has to be clear so that they can understand it easily. Clinical relevance has to be established. No study should be without a relevant a clinical relevance. The entire research paradigm is based on improving patient outcome. There is no other end goal for it. The end goal of it is not getting publication or number of high number of publication or high impact factor publication. The idea is to improve patient outcome. So you need to think about that. That is the first question that comes. Is your st study clinically relevant? Will it add something to the existing knowledge base or not? Okay. Accuracy, especially for the result section. Every number, every decimal has to be very, very accurate and checked and rechecked. Even the table, all the p-values, all the decimal points, percentage has to be accurately checked because that, that is one of the areas where rejections happen. References, citation has to be accurate. Like I said earlier, you should include last two years or last five years if it is a rare disorder. Recent relevant literature for citation in your article. Don't exceed 35 or 44 original article, but keep them relevant and recent. Language, again, is a, another source where I'll not say rejections happen, but the reviewers as well as the editors have give them a kind of negative point so use uh, softwares like grammarly or use your peers to help you improve your language and last point is follow the journal guidelines this is very very important you need to format your article as per the journal guidelines words are at premium whenever you're writing an article so it is limited by journal guidelines, but especially readers' attention. You want readers to read your article. So keep the words at minimum. While writing, think about the reader and the editor perspective, which is very, very important. They may have a perspective that can be completely opposite to you. Sometimes I get reviewers uh, reply, which is very different than what my thought process was. So you have to think in those lines also whenever you're submitting or revising an article. Writing process is a long, I mean, it requires time. You have to give it sufficient time. You can't say that, okay, tomorrow I'll get up and write an article in four days and submit it. No, that's not how it works. Like I said, the end goal is to improve patient outcome. End goal is not to get promotion or just to get a name on, a, on print or something like that. It is a very responsible, behavior doing research and publishing okay it needs sufficient time you are creating something that is timeless so you need to give it sufficient time and own the responsibility of what you have written so thank you very much okay, thank, thank you, you very much uh, as usual that was uh, very precise and uh, useful i'm sure people who set out to write papers or even the thesis, et cetera, will benefit from it. Uh, I hope there are some questions. Uh, we should open it to questions. Yes. So uh, till, uh, we are waiting for a question. Uh, meanwhile, sir, as you have mentioned what uh, the limitation and the strength to be the part of the discussion, what about the future direction, sir? It should be written in the discussion part or in the conclusion part? Yes, conclusion is part of discussion, so and the concluding paragraph of discussion. 
So discussion I divide into four parts just for sake of uh, easiness to understand which things to put in which order. Okay, sir. And so few of the journals, sir, they asked for to write a clinical message. Yeah. So uh, many of us confused with the uh, conclusion and clinical message as the same. So what is what should be written in that? What is the difference between these two, sir? So conclusion is more elaborate while clinical message is very precise. So in one sentence, tell us what you want the reader to learn from your article. That's the clinical message. So clinical message and clinical relevance are similar. So what should reader learn precisely in one sentence from your article? That's it. That's about the clinical message. While conclusion can be, again, three, four points that you feel are also important. So uh, one more uh, doubt about when we are writing a manuscript, what should be the order of writing as according to IMRDs? Oh, so again, so I start with uh, introduction, but I keep on revising each part again and again. So introduction is the first part I write because literature review is first thing I do. So before starting the study, before even planning the study design, etc., with just the title in hand, I go ahead with literature review. So that is the first part you do. So you start with literature review, then you design your study based on the review that you have. Because based on the review, you can define the knowledge gap, and then you can define within your resources and within your capacity of collecting data or having patient population, what is possible. So what is feasible, uh, you need to define. And based on that, then select a study design, go ahead with material methods and collecting data and writing discussion. So first is introduction. But you can revise always. After you get your results, Many times it happens that you have to revise the introduction again because your results are uh, giving you more insights into a lot of more other things that you didn't expect. Yeah. There's a question in the yes. box from Dr. Subhansha. Was yes, a specific. Um, yes, sir. So uh, there are two questions that he has written. One is uh, as a background is for a topic, it's same. It should be written in own language or just mix of three to four journals. So everything in the article has to be written in own language. Anything that is copy pasted or mixed from other journals is plagiarism. So again, like I said, introduction is one of the most misunderstood part of a manuscript. So again, Subhanshu is saying the exact same thing is misunderstanding introduction as the introduction of the subject or the topic. Introduction is defining why your research is relevant in context with the existing literature. So there is a lot of literature on inter, uh, PFN fixation, IT fixation using PFN. You are doing another study, so you have to establish in your introduction why your study is necessary right now. So it may be different geography, different patient population, or a modification or different fracture geometry, whatever it is, you need to define that in your introduction. Introduction need not be huge. It can be just 15, 20 lines, but it has to be precise and give this information. It is not introducing the subject or introducing the topic. It is not at all that, okay? Yeah, I think that's important because you have to, uh kind of make uh, the person who's reading that understand why you're writing a particular paper. Okay, so that's important. There has to be a, and that reason should be relevant, okay? It can't be, oh, I want to write a paper, that's why I'm writing a paper. So there should be a message in it, and that should be the initial part of your introduction is to try and convince the person that you're writing it for the right reasons. Sir. Absolutely. So his other part of question is whether a specific surgical technique should be written or only when some modification is, is there. Then in methodology part, sir, 
when we used to so write the... it depends on if your uh, research is technique based then of course you define the describe the technique whatever modifications you have but if you're using just a standard technique then give a reference of the technique and you don't have to describe it in detail so it depends on what you're doing exactly so he's asked another question of what about discussion yes sir uh, I didn't understand he's saying, but sir, that is the discussion part. Again, discussion part is very specific for your results. You have to discuss only your results. You don't have to discuss anything else. Discussion is not discussion of the topic in general at all. Words are at premium. You got 3000 words only to describe what you want to say. You can't waste even a single sentence on anything that is non-essential and not necessary in your article. Discussion is only on your research points. So write those research uh, result points that you have got, whatever it is, six or eight. Only discussion should happen on those six or eight results points that you have got. There can be any number of uh, discussion points on the topic, but in your article, you are going to discuss only your results, nothing else. So, uh, do you give us some tips to write a title? Because sir, sometimes it is said that it should be concise and also describing the whole method what you are doing. So, how we should write a title? Okay. So, again, you can follow. So, I had a talk on that, but let me get back to it. So, you need to follow the Pico format in title. Okay, so population intervention, control or comparison and outcome measure. So if your title has all four of these, so it will have the study design, it will have the population that you're intervening, what you're intervening and what is the hypothesis. So frame your title as that, that is the standard teaching. Again, there is more teaching coming now to make your title interesting to the reader also. So you can again, twist your title to make it more interesting. So I find interesting titles more relevant. I mean, I'll go and read the abstract if the title is really interesting. For a standard thesis, you need to follow the Pico format and have the study design also in it. So I'll see if I can find it. It's very interesting. The Okay, any other questions till then? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, sure. yes, sir. One thing uh, which uh, in few of the articles we used to see that we have taken the ethical approval. They start with that one. Mm -hmm. So is it relevant to write sir, in the theory part, like in the methodology part? To write, yes. we have taken the ethical approval and we are starting yes. the study. Is it yes. always need to write or? We can go ahead. So for every study, ethical approval is needed. Okay. And uh, so this was again a question asked to me even during viral. So looking at what your end goal is, your end goal is to improve patient outcome by publishing your experience so that others can read it and utilize it in the patient. If you have a, you are an independent practitioner, but you have some, something that is clinically relevant, which you feel when read by many people will help them. Go ahead, write your paper, write to the editor saying, this is the conclusion that I have. I have consent of the patients. But since in my scenario, I don't have an ethical committee in my hospital or I work at multiple places and it is very difficult for me to get ethical approval, please consider this as my but this is applicable mostly for retrospective observational studies, not for a prospective this... interventional study where it becomes really important for you to take ethical approval. If there are independent ethics committee that will give you approvals, so you need that. For case reports, you don't need it, although NMC still mention it that you need it, but consent of the patient should be good enough for that. Take a call depending on uh, what your study design is. Yeah, I think for any uh, 
So if you're doing any new um, uh, sort of uh, therapeutic study, where you're trying a new drug or a new uh, surgical technique which hasn't been used before, then I think for those you would definitely need ethical review. Yes. Ethics committee review. Uh, if it is a retrospective study where you've uh, looked at all your cases over the last 10 years, I think there, if you have the facility to get it, it makes sense, but I don't think it's always um, mandatory to do that. Okay, so you can write, so, so, so someone like uh, say Ashok or someone who's not working in an institution which has an uh, ethics committee on the scientific committee there, it will be difficult for them to get a, you can't form an ethics committee of your own certainly. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, like, when we are submitting some article, uh, there are few articles which got rejected. So, what to do with that, sir? That is actually because your hard work for about six months or seven months. And if it gets, it gets rejected, it's quite painful if you really worked it hard for that. So, for those things, because time also is quite important, sir. What to do for that? So don't get discouraged. <laughs> take the take whatever reviewers have said about the article positively. Revise the article definitely, and submit it to a different journal with similar scope. That's yeah. how the roadmap is. There is no other roadmap to that. Yeah, I think. Uh... Usually, the reviewers will give you very good reasons for the rejection of the article. Um, you may not agree with them. That's a different thing. But they have their reasons. And you have to understand that that's how maybe the next reviewer is also going to look at it. Okay, Because you may have one idea, but uh, maybe a group of other people think that it's a, there's a different way to write that article. And they will, if they don't like it, they're going to say it's not fit for publication and that happens to very a lot of people it's not just uh, i think uh, even the uh, people who publish the most have had the articles rejected at various yeah i mean i will have more rejections than acceptance always even the uh, ganga hospital score got rejected three or four times by jbgs before it eventually got published but they, so in spite of the great huge volume of study, etc., that they done, it took them a long time to actually get the get it published in JBJS. So in in the last slide, should, uh, okay. Just one question, yes, sir. Yes. In the last slide, you have mentioned about a redundant publication. What actually that means? That, uh, like you said, time is important. Something that data was collected around 10 years, 12 years back is not important, relevant, no longer now. So a lot of people keep on doing that. They take very old data sets and publish it now. I mean, the follow-up is also not now. It's a old paper that was kept there, data was collected, it didn't reach to publication, and then they bring it back and start doing it, redoing it again. So. And that's one, and the other could be something that's been written so many times that it has no relevance anymore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Something results of PFN for DOJ for trochanteric fractures without any specifics attached to it. It's going to be rejected before you know it. Yeah. And so what about the publication of the thesis? If it, is, it got accepted after that, do the postgraduate can publish it? That is, uh... I think they should always publish the thesis. After the acceptance sir, or before that? After the you, acceptance. How can you publish it before it's accepted? Yeah, that's that's true. Sir. So yes. after the acceptance of the thesis, because it will require there are few journals as well as their thesis repositories. So you can submit your thing there. The idea is to have the data bank there. So your data is safeguarded online. So anybody who wants to do a systematic review or a meta-analysis will have your data set ready as a pool of data created.
Yes. Okay. I think with the, that, it's almost 7 14 45. So we should call it at close. Sir. Thank you very much, Ashok. Thank you. Great, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody, till next week. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir.